Welcome and thank you for joining us today for another edition of uh, our Fortnightly Irina Insights webinar series. We are back after a few weeks uh, break. My name is Martina Lyons and I'm from the Irina Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn, Germany. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I would just like to introduce very shortly uh, to IRENA and also our webinar series. So IRENA is an intergovernmental organization. We have currently 167 member countries and another 17 countries are in their accession process. What we do, we support these countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future, and we serve as the principal platform for international cooperation, center of excellence, and a repository of policy, technology, resource, and financial knowledge on renewable energy. And because our analytical work and our engagement with our member countries generates a lot of valuable insights, we are constantly looking for different ways uh, to share those insights with you. And that is why we launch this webinar series, which we run every other week, usually on Tuesday. We started in January 2020, so before all the pandemics proliferated many virtual events. So far, we have over or around 40 webinars on various topics, and you can check them all on our uh, IRENA events website and also on our YouTube channel. We are aware that there are many other longer deep dive webinars and discussion out there, but what we are trying to do here is on contrary to keep these webinars short. They last approximately 30 minutes, which means we clearly cannot cover any, everything, but the idea is to give you enough to decide whether you want to delve deeper into the topic or not. And we signpost in our presentations further resource sources of more in-depth information to help you to do that. Next slide, please. So today in the next 30 minutes or so, uh, while you enjoy your coffee or your tea, I'm very excited to say that we are going to hear from Francesco Passimeni, who is Irina's uh, lead uh, or who leads Irina's work on patents. And then from our guest from uh, European Patents Office, uh, Gerd Booth, who is a business analyst working uh, on the business use of patent information. Less than a month ago, uh, Irina and EPO, part of particularly our speakers, publish an extensive report on innovation trends in electrolyzers technology for hydrogen production. And the report analyzes patent statistics to really reveal the trends and dynamics uh, in the exciting field of hydrogen that can be produced using renewable electricity via electrolyzers. There is a great momentum right now around hydrogen and particularly green hydrogen and our speakers will share with you insights into the trends in patents filing, what does it signal and what will address urgent need for new solutions to lower the cost of electrolyzers in parallel with rising technological efficiency and production capacity. But before I hand over the microphone to Francesco and Gert, uh, just very briefly a few usual housekeeping items, which you certainly are all aware of from other uh, online events. So we are recording the webinar. We will uh, post the recording and slides on the IRENA events website in the next uh, 48 hours. You are all on mute. Uh, if, you question, if you have questions for our speakers, please use the chat function. And don't forget to give us your feedback in a short survey, which will be available after the webinar. And after, without any further ado, let me uh, welcome Francesco and Gert. Uh, hi, Francesco. How, Gert? Welcome Hello. and over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Martina. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon to all. Well, today um, we are presenting this uh, work that we have done in, co in cooperation with the EPAO. And uh, before starting, I would like to um, uh, set the, um, the role of hydrogen that has in 1.5 decarbonization scenario. As you can see in this slide, we, um, if by 2050, there will be more than 20,000 per, um, per, uh, per hour of electricity demand for green hydrogen. That is equivalent to what we consume today. To, do, to achieve this goal, uh, there is a need to integrate electrolyzer in the power system and to find synergies with renewable generation. Electrolyzer is a, cru a crucial technology for enabling the production of renewable uh, hydrogen since it allows water electrolysis powered by renewable sources. So it is important to find innovation that allow to reduce costs for electrolyzer, which are again critical for uh, the uh, decarbonization scenario. 
ARENA has developed a number of studies in uh, relation to green hydrogen. And today, as we announced previously, uh, we are presenting the e patent insight report on innovation trend in electrolyzer for hydrogen production. This report is the result of uh, a, a long-standing cooperation with the EPO, the European Patent Office, that uh, um, the cooperation aims to promote, promote innovation in the uh, renewable energy technology. So with the ARENA and the EPO have produced this report and have tracked uh, the evolution of patent in the last 15 years. Um, in uh, and highlighting uh, important trends and key actors on this technology area. So the goal is to provide the stakeholder with evidence on, um, on this technology to better understand what are the trends, the innovation trends in electrolyzers. So today's presentation is divided in two parts. The first one will be uh, my colleague Gert from EPO that will present to you the methodology and how we use patent information for analyzing this, uh, for producing this analysis. And then I will come back by uh, and present the key findings of the uh, report. So Gert, uh, over to you. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Martina, for the very nice introduction. Uh, my name is Gerd Butt. I work at the EPO in Vienna. Uh, EPO in Vienna is uh, the EPO office that is specialized in dealing with patent information and patent knowledge. And in my daily task, I am the application manager for user application management for the PATSAT database, which is one of the main databases used by researchers and policymakers all over the world with regards to, uh, well, uh, policymakers that need uh, large sets of uh, patent data. Uh, next slide, please. So when I start talking about patent data, I, I like to start with a quote from Edward Deming, who said, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And to which uh, Jones and Silver Central Force uh, replied, well, without an opinion, you're just another person with data. And this, this is exactly what patent insight reports are about. We we're trying to match uh, data and data analysis and statistics with an opinion. And that's not always easy because it's, um, Sometimes you have a gut feeling and say, we think that, but we have to always try to translate the thinking that into the data or into what we can observe from the data. And very often when we start looking into data, what our gut feeling is telling us and what we're thinking is not always what the data is telling us. Or sometimes we have to reach a conclusion that the data which we have been working with is maybe flawed or incomplete, or uh, basically that the data needs to have an extra look at to, to at the end maybe confirm what our gut feelings are telling us. Next slide, please. So in the presentation, I will talk, touch on three uh, different uh, small topics. First of all, what are patent insight reports? What does it mean for the EPO? I will talk about the expert involvement on the side of the EPO, and then a little bit about statistical analysis versus patentability searches, because after all, the core task or the main task of the EPO is to grant uh, European patents or to grant patents for or EPO member states, uh, which means basically that we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of patents every year, which our examiners have to look at and at the end make a decision on whether or not to grant the patent. So it's basically our core business. You could say patent information, patent data is a little bit of a site activity, but it's a very important site activity. Um, next slide, please. So on the patent insight reports, what do we do there? Well, all the reports that we make uh, focus on future and emergent technologies. And we, some, we often abbreviate this as FETA, eh? F-E-T-A, like also like the cheese for, for the future and emerging technologies. You could of course say, is, you could of, of course ask yourself the question whether or not electrolysis is an emerging technology. Electrolysis have been um, around for a very long time. If you look at the earliest patents, I think you can find them somewhere in 1800 already, uh, where somebody was using an, uh, an, a cathode and an anode to produce uh, hydrogen and to produce oxygen. Uh, so the technology has been around for quite a long time, but it's only now with the uh, green transition that um, that industry and also policymakers really start considering uh, scaling up this technology to where it can complement or existing sources of energy or storing energy and, and start considering uh, hydrogen as, as, a, as, a viable, as a viable alternative to 
uh, for example, batteries and, and, and other ways of, of storing energy. So the reports which we produce, they include always the search strategy, how to retrieve the relevant information based on public pattern data and the key findings. And in this, we of course, we, we cooperate very close with IRENA because it built on one hand on the expertise of the EPO subject matter experts, or let's say in easy terms, or, 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 uh, or patent examiners who are really experts in the technical field. And also, of course, in cooperation with policy and business experts, in this case, of course, with IRENA, who knows exactly or who knows much better than what we do, what is happening in the market, where is technology being applied, and where is technology uh, missing also to, to make it more, let's say, more future ready. So in the patent insight reports, we distribute or we talk about the methodology. We are very open about that. So this is not a black box, uh, black box approach. We are very open also about the data. Uh, we also provide the data and we also provide or let's say our insights or our results and they're all free to use. Why do we provide the data and the methodology? Well, I think when we started doing this report, the very first time we looked at the data and start, started thinking about, okay, what will we talk about is about a year ago. And uh, patents is, um, patents, okay, patents get continuously filed but patents only become available to the public, normally speaking, speaking, 18 months after the patents have been filed. So we're always working with a bit of a delay on what is happening. And because we can only see with a bit of delay what is happening, in fact, at, at the site of industry, at the, at the site of researchers who are filing patents. So for us, it's of crucial importance that we share the methodology and that we share the data so that anybody who's reading the report can have a clear idea about what's in the report and what's not in the report. And by sharing the methodology, we also allow, of course, other researchers to replicate or to, let's say, apply the methodology and apply what we could say in simple terms or search queries to continue and to look at new data that is appearing basically every day or every week for TPO. Next slide, please. Right. So pattern insight reports, what have we been publishing at EPO? Well, here you see basically a list. We have been doing things on cosmonautics, quantum met meteorology and sensing, uh, CAR T cells, electrolysis for hydrogen, you, you see standing there. And, 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 and for 2022, there are further reports planned at EPO on offshore wind energy, spaceborne sen sensing and green applications, and also on quantum computing. So that's basically the set of of um, that is basically the set of, of uh, patent site reports that we have at this moment available. Next slide, please. So what is the function then of DPO? What, where do we stand? Well, as I mentioned before, we have thousands of technical subject matters. That's a unique situation where we have so much insights and or so much experts who are experts in, in a certain field. DPO is also a central provider of high quality patent data or worldwide patent data. We collect data from all over the world and we built up a database there with a patent, in, a patent data that contains at this moment about 120 million patent applications from all over the world. So that gives us a good uh, data set to work with and to conduct statistical analysis with. And then apart from that, of course, EPO has a longstanding experience also in working with large uh, sets of patent data. And we do this happily now together with experts in the field like IRENA that are um, that have a better insight on what is happening basically with technology and when, it, when it's being applied. Next slide, please. So the, yeah. so the main difference between uh, what the EPO does as core business and landscaping is basically uh, when examiners look at data, they look at very specific data. They look at small sets of data. When we do landscaping, we work with statistics and we do large, we use large sets of data. So the output of the work that an examiner is doing is mostly a limited list of patterns. We call this a search report. While when we when we, at EPO, when we do statistical analysis, we look, we look at very large sets of data. So an unlimited sample of patterns, dependent of course on what kind of search, what kind of search query we are doing. Next slide, please. And to do so, we have different tools. So when an examiner looks at a patent, he looks at it with the idea of what patents are relevant to grant this patent or to not grant this patent, for which he has specific tools to, to quickly narrow down to a set of patents that are relevant to make a decision on granting a patent. When we do landscaping, we are not interested in, in finding three or five interesting patents. We are interested in finding all the patents that are relevant 
for doing the statistical analysis. So we use different tools. The data sets are the same, but the tools are different. Next slide, please. And then, of course, we come to the question of uh, precision and recall. When examiners do their work, they're looking for very high precision and very, very low recall. In other words, when somebody files a patent, you don't want to get a search report with hundred, with, let's say, with thousand relevant patents uh, to make a decision whether or not to grant the patent. When we do statistical analysis, we don't want to find five patents that are very rele relevant for the technology. We want to find the 150 patents and maybe 10 in it that are less relevant, but we want to have larger sets. So this is doing this kind of analysis. The methodology always means you have to balance a little bit between uh, recall and precision. And for statistical analysis, we tend to go for higher recall and a bit less precision than what examiners are doing. They cannot cite patents that are irrelevant in a search report when looking at patents. Next slide, please. So the methodology uh, goes basically through four different steps. First of all, we do a preparation. We look at what, what are the relevant technology, technological fields that we want to implement in the report. We then make the queries or we, create, we develop keywords or classification codes we use to develop queries to extract the data. Once that is done, we visualize, we look at connections, we look at correlations, we look at trends, we formulate or start formulating insights. And then at the end, when the report is done, we explain the approach. That's what we're doing now. We explain the approach and we share the queries and we, we also provide training. Next slide, please. So. Uh, a small word about the identification of the relevant techno technological fields. When we started the project, we looked at, okay, what are now really the, the issues uh, at hand with electrolysis? And the main issues are their scale, scaling up, costs, and efficiency. And we therefore we thought, okay, let's split this up a little bit in different groups. And we then looked at cell operation conditions, electrocatalyst materials, elect uh, anodes and cathodes, what kind of materials are being used, what kind of shifts do we see? What kind of trends do we see? We look also at the stacks, at, at the diaphragms or the membranes that we use. We looked at stackability. And then we had a separate, a separate chapter, basically, where we looked at photoelectrolysis, which is a little bit different, in fact, from, from pure, what we, what we call the, the classical the class, classical electrolyzers. Now, to give you a small example, um, well, on this slide, you can see that under each of the headings or each of the topics, you see a code standing there, Q04, Q05, you see standing there, or on noble metals, you see Q19. And these are the references to the queries that we have been using all throughout the search report. Uh, now, at the Excel sheet or at the data sheet that is provided with the report or that you can get, you will find the same references back. And you will also see that we have done uh, queries that we have not used in the report. So th this reflects a little bit to the previous slide where I mentioned it's a little bit of seeking and finding out what is relevant and what is not relevant. And it's only diff it's very difficult to define from the beginning. It is relevant before you have looked at the data. So you will find more, uh, more analysis and more data in the, in the data sheets than what we have effectively been using in the report. Next slide, please. So the example I used here with the noble metals, you can see they're basically a Boolean, a Boolean search query where we use classification codes in combination with keywords. And what we tried to do that, what we did, we did not try, we managed to do it, was the retrieving all the patterns where uh, electrocatalyst materials are mentioned in combination with the use of noble metals. Because when we started the report, we thought, can we identify a trend such as that there is a stepping away of noble noble metals and noble 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 metal oxides um, for the production of uh, electrocatalyst materials for for electrolysis? Um, as you can see, it is not so easy to simply say, okay, we have a classification code and we manage all. Though, if you look at the three classification codes codes mentioned there, we have B11, 081, 097, 093. They all look the same. It's about electrodes using a noble metal. But basically, for examiners, there is a difference between an electrode where one noble metal is used or several noble metals are used, for example, in layers, or where noble metals or noble oxides are used in combination with, for example, non-noble metals. So examiners, they really go to great lengths in at detailed level classifying patterns and um, and, um, and, and basically labeling patterns. And then even the last one, you can see where electrodes consist of a single catalytic, uh, catalytic uh, element or a compound in combination with, for example, keywords as platinum, gold, silver, rutium, iridium, 
And so we have added that as well to retrieve all the patterns that are relevant. Next slide, please. Um, so if we run that, that query, this is Q19. So all the queries which we have used in the, in the, in the, research, uh, in the research report have been translated to or free uh, Pats, uh, sorry, to our free SPASNet database. So they are available, they are there sitting as URL links and you can immediately click on them. And when you do this in SPASNet, there is a possibility there to immediately also look at data. And as you can see here from the left graph, you can see that we used, that I, that I looked at the data there that uh, for patterns that were published between 2005 and 2022, of course, the 2020-22 data is not included in our search report because we did the data extraction before this, uh, before 2022. Uh, basically, we did it uh, last year. And then if you then look further, you can see other, other sets of uh, ready-made statistics that are available in this past set. You see where patents have been filed. In this case, you see China, you see the main applicants, you see where what, what country do the applicants come from. And then at, on, the, on the very right side, you see, for example, also what are the CPC main groups of the patents that have been retained by this Q19, where we looked at noble metals or noble metal oxides. And one of the, one of the uh, classification codes you see there is the Y02E60, which is what we call the Y tag specific for hydrogen technology and for fuel cell technology. So that is basically in line with, we can see that electrocatalyst materials patterns in that field are effectively also used in hydrogen and fuel cell technology, which is what we expected or which we we'll also hope for. Next slide, please. All right. So, um, Extracting data and looking at data is very interesting, but there comes a lot of cleaning involved. And especially when you do uh, statistics or graphs where you look at hit lists or hit lists, we call this rankings, it is very important to use harmonized names. And in our data sets, and I'm not talking about the spot set then, but for example, in the PADSAT database, we have several methodologies of harmonizing names. It boils down to the fact that when you do a ranking, you want to be sure that the ranking is correctly done because applicants or the companies that file patents often file patents under different variations of the names. So decisions have to be made there to say, okay, we will group these companies or let's say this company names as together being one company. And one of the companies that are uh, very active in electrolyzer technology is the Nora from Italy. But you see there uh, six, seven variations of the names that the Nora has been using in filing patents specifically in the field of uh, electrolyzer technology. The same with NTT, the same with Samsung, uh, I think uh, the same with Siemens, in fact. So with all large companies, we see that there is a large variation under the names that have been using for filing patterns. And that is something that needs to be cleaned up. And then another, uh, next slide, please. And then another cleaning up or another problem that needs to be solved is the strong overrepresentation of signal patents families in China. When uh, Francesco and me looked at the data, we were quite amazed to see that China was hitting uh, the top rankings everywhere. We started looking into why does it happen? And we observed that the reason it is, is because China is filing an awful lot of patents that are only active in China. So they don't go abroad. They're filed by Chinese applicants only in China and they don't, they don't go any, anywhere else. And we, we, we said, this is, this is basically a problem because it provides, it, it, even if the patents might be relevant for the technology, it, uh, it produces a lot of noise when you look at the statistics. And on the, on the right side of the column of the table, you can see there that I have added their family size. This, so all these patents are basically patents that do not have other patent families. So single patents filed in China. Next slide, please. So we decided, okay, if we don't want to see Chinese companies and Chinese applicants appearing at the top list with numbers that are three, four times as high as number two, we had to uh, use a methodology to, uh, to reduce this over-representing of, of single patent families in China. So we introduced there a concept. We have the freedom to do that. And we are the analysts. We say we have, we have an issue which we want to deal with. And we introduced the concept of international patent families. These international patent families are patent families that have more than one country in the list of patent publications, applicants, inventors, or first priority countries. Yeah, so it is uh, the advantage of using this, let's say, rather uh, simple definition is that the single national filings are excluded, not only the Chinese, eh? the same goes for all patents that have been filed, also in, in, in also US patent families or Japanese or Korean. 
Uh, another advantage is it's very easy to implement from a data aggregation point of view because we do have the countries from the applicants, the inventors, we do have patent family information. And this leads them to a higher quality of the patents in the data sample. So basically, it's a, a, the, it's a, a better representation for higher impact or high impact patterns. Next slide, please. So this then resulted in uh, us producing an Excel sheet, an Excel sheet where you will find all the all the queries which we have been using, the search strategies with the URL links that go immediately to Espasnet. So we are open and naked about what we did there. And then um, my colleague Francesco also produced a very fantastic Tableau workbook where he introduced and the data or made the data interactive available. But uh, Francesco will tell you more about that. Next slide, please. And that's the last one from my side. Um, after the uh, <clears throat> when the report is now published and produced, uh, we launched it. We looked at cooperation with the partners. We looked at cooperation with Arena. Uh, we have been promoting this through uh, social media, through our respective websites, news flashes, and we will be presenting, of course, the findings also at various conferences, various happenings as this one now taking place. Francesco, I realized I went a little bit over time, but now you have the stage. Yeah, if I, if I can just uh, interrupt quickly, very uh, thank you very much, Kert. If we can ask everyone to stay a little longer, we will eliminate the Q&A part, but uh, the key findings are very uh, insightful. So please stay with us. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Gert, and thanks, uh, Martina. So here now I'm going to uh, present you the key findings, briefly summarize what you will find in the report, and actually I strongly suggest you to go to the report and check in details all the results that uh, are there. So the main result here is uh, um, is the uh, number of uh, patent activity of patent uh, family related to water electrolysis compared to a uh, patent related to um, hydrogen produced by uh, from hydrocarbons. And what we see here that uh, starting from 2015 2016 the number of uh, patent related to electrolysis started to increase and become higher each year than uh, the other uh, technology called hydrocarbons. And this is important message because this is a result not only from the uh, R&D effort from company or organization, but also for the entire ecosystem of innovation since uh, all the countries have committed already to uh, to develop green hydrogen. So there are several targets uh, nationwide to produce more and more hydrogen from renewable sources. The, the report is then divided in five uh, subsections. Each of them uh, focus on a specific technology area. As Gerst already mentioned, these are uh, cell operating condition structure, uh, materials, uh, separators, membranes, stackability, and the photoelectrolyzers. Um, what we see in this graph is that uh, in each of these uh, five technologies, the key player, let's say European countries, you know, and Japan, China, US, uh, Korea, and other and have contributed for a certain amount in, uh, in terms of patent uh, patent families and what we see is that european countries and japan all together cover more than 50 percent in all the technology area the us almost average uh, 50 uh, 18 percent in all the technology and here we see what Gert was saying before that uh, china has an average of four percent of international patent families in all the five technologies because of the is higher um, it's high focus on the domestic market now going in each of these main uh, areas the first one is uh, the one focus on uh, cell operating parameters and what we see here that the most uh, relevant categories are those um, related to patent on cell operating at atmospheric uh, pressure and ambient temperature but even though we see that um, high pressure uh, patents related to high pressure are also getting relevant in the in the last uh, few years and this is a crucial for <clears throat> reduction of green hydrogen, cost reduction from green hydrogen production. The second material, the second uh, category is uh, the electrocatalyst materials. Uh, that is a material, scarce material is a bottleneck for the scale up of this technology. 
And what we need is to find new solutions to replace uh, uh, materials with, uh, for example, not noble methods. And indeed, uh, this graph shows that um, uh, the number of non noble metals, allowance, and uh, ceramics started to grow after 2014. And right now, in 2020, they are half the number of uh, uh, the uh, patent related to noble metals. So, this is again signals that there are already innovations and activities in this critical uh, um, technology area. The third one is uh, concerning the uh, separate membranes uh, because the, um, it will allow to have uh, um, better performance <clears throat> on production of nitrogen. And uh, uh, what we see here, so while the uh, inorganic membranes are more or less stable, stable over time, uh, starting from 2011, we we'll see a huge increase of uh, international patent is related to uh, polymer membranes, where US and Japan are the two most uh, prominent countries in this area. The fourth one is uh, the uh, stackability of electrolyzers, since the aim is to have economy of scale by producing, by having a gigawatt uh, manufacturing facilities. And in this specific technology area, the uh, category that is more prominent is uh, the stack type without bipolar elements. And what is interesting here is that until uh, 2014, US was the leading country in this area. And after that, Japan uh, became first. The last one uh, is the uh, photoelectrolysis, which allow to produce hydrogen uh, by renewable resources. And indeed the most relevant uh, uh, category here is the uh, photoelectrolysis with uh, photovoltaic as power source. And uh, what we see in this area is that there are countries such as Saudi Arabia and the Netherlands that are getting more involved in developing this technology, uh, particularly from uh, starting from 2015. And university, particularly in Saudi Arabia, are uh, helping developing this uh, technology. So to quickly conclude, what we have seen here is that uh, um, electrolyzer is a key, a key technology for the uh, transition to a green, a nitrogen based energy system. And we still need to find more solutions to uh, lower the cost and at the same time raising uh, technology efficiency and uh, production capacity. So in the five main area, what you've seen is that there are searches for uh, optimal condition, operation condition for electrolyzers. Uh, there is already a focus on non noble methods in order to mitigate the effect of material scarcity. Um, to increase performance and durability, there are uh, activities on uh, separator membranes, as well as uh, the, the, the importance of finding this, uh, of focus on the stackability of electrolyzers to increase, uh, to make uh, production of hydrogen more economic. And, uh, um, and the last one is the emerging trend on uh, that is quite relevant. Now, before concluding, I will uh, again highlight that we have produced an uh, online dashboard and below you have the link to, to go and check for the data. This is a, um, an online dashboard where we have all the data that we have used in the report. So you can simply uh, filter data by technology, category, key player, years. And so you automatically can see the trend of specific technology and then you can use also for your own analysis. So I'll stop here and I thanks for the attention and I pass the floor to Martin again. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Francesco. And thank you all for uh, staying with us. We, we ran a little bit over uh, time, so uh, I will just say that uh, we will skip the Q&A, uh, but we are going to share the presentation and the recording on the website, which I, sh which I shared in the chat.
And uh, if you have any questions on our speakers, uh, here are two uh, email addresses. You can reach out to them uh, directly. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I would like to thank uh, Francesco and Hert for their time, for sharing with us uh, all their knowledge and experience with using uh, patents to uncover dynamics in electrolyzers uh, for hydrogen production. And I would like to thank you all for joining us today, for listening. And I hope you learn, uh, or we hope uh, you learned something new and that you will uh, join us in two weeks when we will have a webinar that will that would delve deeper into the roadmaps or uh, decarbonization pathways of South America. The registration will be open uh, tomorrow and we look forward to seeing you again. Um, in the survey, you can also leave to us uh, some comments about the topics you are interested in, uh, and we will try to cover them in the future. So that is all from us for today. I wish you a great rest of the day. Uh, again, thank you all. Uh, goodbye and see you soon.